Welcome to Basics of Quantum Mechanics. Uh, well, like it says, it's about Basics of Quantum Mechanics and it's going to be pretty fast. So <coughs> this is the introductory uh, outline of what we're going to do. And uh, there's 27 topics here. Um, quantum Mechanics is a little bit of a mathematical topic and it's a bit confusing compared to other kinds of theories like classical mechanics. So we're going to really talk first about what a physical theory is and how those, what, what a, how theories work. And you will see that mathematics is quite important for quantum mechanics. So what most of this section is going to be about is actually maths. Uh, and specifically linear algebra, vectors, matrices, functions as vectors, Hilbert spaces, all those kinds of things. And the reason why we're going to talk about these vector spaces is because they're necessary for getting approximate approximations to equations that are too difficult to solve. Um, but we're pretty much going to go straight into the maths. Uh, we're going to talk about eventually eigenproblems, all that kind of thing, determinants. And eventually, towards the end, we're going to actually get to the rules of quantum mechanics. You can't just get to the rules because the rules are expressed in terms of the mathematics. So we need to cover that mathematics first. After that, we talk a little bit about momentum, angular momentum, ladder operators and spin. Uh, these kinds of things are quite important in spectroscopy and spin is very very important for electrons and some things about that are a little bit weird um, perhaps this part is a little bit advanced for chemistry but we're still going to do it okay so let's get going shall we All right, topic one, what is a physical theory? Right, we're gonna be learning about quantum theory, but first we need to know what a physical theory actually is. Okay, if you wanna know what a theory is, you have to distinguish between um, what the theory is about and how we make predictions in that theory. So on the left hand side we have here um, a space of physics and chemistry problems like these problems can involve molecules, reactions, all those kinds of things. Right, that involves doing something and it doesn't involve any maths. No way. Nothing in the real world really involves maths. That involves real stuff. And real stuff has got really got nothing to do with mathematics. Now, we can, however, translate some of the concepts in this uh, real world into mathematics. Uh, for example, we might decide that we want to describe cricket balls and how they move. So we might want to describe the position of the cricket ball and how fast it's going. Okay, so we have these ideas of position and how fast and we know they've got something to do with hurting us if the cricket ball hits us in the head and if the position happens to be right on top of our head so those are kinds of concepts but they don't they don't really become precise unless we record the position as numbers which are measurable so here we're talking about physical theories and physical theories definitely involve numbers so what we can do is we can convert these concepts by some kind of correspondence rule. This is a little bit vague, but we do that. That part was always a little bit vague. Uh, this part is all, the left part is all about discussion and what's right and what's wrong. And then we, we get this correspondence rule and we represent the position by mathematical things like three numbers. Three numbers records a position in three dimensional space. A vector, which you might know about, uh, is a quantity normally defined with magnitude and direction that could represent a velocity. And those are maths objects. Now we're into the realm of maths objects 
and we can then apply rules. Uh, usually these rules are laws expressed as mathematical laws and we can use algebra and stuff like that to get an answer. The answer can be a number uh, or it can be a vector or whatever the maths object is and then we have to translate that object or number back into reality. For example, that number may represent pressure or it may represent the recoil velocity of the cricketer when he's hit on his head. All right, and that gives us the answer. So there's the two different worlds. There's the uh, left side of the world, which is the real kind of thing. That you can argue about whether it's real or not, but it's certainly what we see. And then we translate this into another kind of world, which is a mathematical world, a very precise world, where we can do calculations. And we express our laws on, on, on this side. Okay, in classical mechanics, uh, as I, I, I've kind of already said, the mass objects are things like coordinates, vectors, densities, velocities, and forces, and we have Newton's laws and all that kind of thing. But it's different for quantum theory. In quantum theory, um, uh, objects are, are different. So a physical theory, uh, first I'll tell you about a physical theory. A physical theory is quantitative, makes use of mathematics, and we've said all of that kind of stuff here and one can use mathematics to get the answers there. Okay, so that's that. So what are the main objects in quantum mechanics? So we have this, uh, again, physics thing over here, but over here now we don't have a classical mathematical representation. The objects we talk about in quantum mechanics are not positions. They're actually functions. Another word for a function is a state. So that's one critical object in um, quantum mechanics. And the other thing is the operator. Operators are things which change one function to another. So what do I mean by a function? Okay, a function is a one-dimensional function would be something like f of x equals x squared. That would be a parabola, or 2x squared. Um, such a thing is a one-dimensional function. The objects in quantum mechanics uh, are at least three or four dimensional and uh, they're quite complicated functions or states. Okay, and the rules or laws that apply to these functions uh, is the Schrodinger equation. So the main object actually in quantum mechanics is called the wave function. The wave function is a function of all the coordinates of the particles in the system, which we usually break down into electrons and protons. <laughs> electrons and nuclei, positively charged nuclei comprising protons and neutrons. We don't usually separate them, we just call them nuclei, even though they're protons and neutrons. So we talk about the coordinates of the nuclei and the coordinates of the electrons. And uh, if there's 10 electrons in the system and two nuclei, uh, we have, what, 12 particles, each of them at least three dimensions to describe. So 12 times three is 36 dimensions minimum. So that's the wave function, 36 dimensional. And all of that can depend on time. So that might be 36 plus one dimension is 37. In fact, we'll see there's even an extra coordinate. Each particle usually has a spin. So it's not only x, y, z, but there's another coordinate called spin. Uh, so it's, it's actually 12 times 4. 48 coordinates is what we have in that wave function. The key thing is that the wave function has all the information concerning the quantum mechanical system. Now, the wave function is a bit strange. Um, it by itself, it doesn't determine anything observable, but the square of the wave function determines the probability distribution for locating particles in space, the instantaneous probability distribution of particles in space. So that's called the Born Rule. He actually got a Nobel Prize for working out that psi squared uh, represents the probability distribution of the particle, although that was only noted in a footnote of one of his papers. So he got the Nobel Prize for a footnote in one of his papers. It was just basically an excuse to give him a Nobel Prize, if you ask me. Uh, 
Right, so that's the wave function. Um, now, what about operators? Well, operators are objects which change one function to another function. Operators operate on functions to change one function to, to another function. A very simple kind of operation would be multiplication by 3 or division by 2. So we can also add a constant to a function, like a function plus 1 is another function, a different function. So those are very boring and simple operations. A more interesting operation is derivatives. If we take the derivative of a function, we change that function into another one, like a slope function. Um, now, here's something quite tricky. In quantum mechanics, operators represent an experiment of some kind. Experiments in quantum mechanics are represented by operators. Now, you're in third year, so you've probably heard of Schrodinger's equation, h psi equals e psi, where h is the Hamiltonian operator. The Hamiltonian is the total energy operator, and it comprises derivatives and functions and all of that kind of thing. But that Hamiltonian operator changes at one function into another function, and it represents the experiment of measuring the energy. I'm telling you that. That's what it is. The Schrodinger equation is an equation which determines the energies of the allowed energies of the system, h psi equals e psi. It's, an, it's representing an experiment that measures, a perfect experiment that would measure the energy. Okay, so that's the main objects in quantum mechanics, functions and operators. Okay. That's very strange. Why does quantum mechanics use functions and operators? There's basically two reasons. Uh, unlike classical mechanics, it was noticed uh, very early on that uh, energies are not always discrete, uh, not always continuous. So for example, here's an experiment where people passed a current through a mercury vapor, those mercury vapor lamps, which are kind of like orangey looking. Um, they're very efficient, not as efficient as LEDs, but uh, back in the day they were quite efficient. So if you measure the current through this mercury vapour, that low vapour, what you find is as you increase the voltage, the current increases and then it decreases, then it increases and decreases and increases. So it displays a kind of uh, peaked behaviour with peaks around about, I don't know, 4.9 then another one at 8, uh, 9.8, and then another one a bit further on, sort of like in multiples. So that seemed to indicate that the um, something about the mercury is not um, a constant, like you, it's not a homogeneous thing. Like you, and normally if something's homogeneous, it sort of behaves the same. Uh, or at least continuously, it doesn't go, uh, I don't want to say continuously, but um, it uniformly increases. It doesn't go up and down and up and down. What that indicates is the atoms have some kind of structure to them, which is possibly discrete, and, these, and the energies of the things in that atom are possibly discrete. No, it, the whole thing isn't completely discrete because obviously the current doesn't go to zero but something in there is a little bit uh, discrete, which is unusual. Uh, here's another experiment which was done uh, later. I, I mean, this is 1988, so long, long after quantum mechanics is accepted. But the same kind of experiment now, where we apply voltage across uh, dissociated hydrogen atoms. So this is obviously at high temperature. And you apply voltage 0, 4, 8, 12, up to 24 volts per centimeter. And what you see is peaks, uh, and these peaks uh, correspond to uh, currents that are coming off. Uh, essentially, when you apply a voltage, electrons are being sucked off the hydrogen atom, and they come off in these peaks. So somehow the energy of electrons in the hydrogen atom has certain values. So these are just sort of discrete, not completely discrete, very much so, 
certainly not continuous. And then there's a certain point where after a certain voltage there's no more peaks and the electrons just come off uh, completely or, or basically at that point there's no electrons left to come off. Okay so that's the first reason. Uh, energy is a discrete. The second thing is um, some experiments produce totally random results even when they're repeated very very carefully. The classic experiment is when an electron passes through uh, two holes or slits which are very very close together of the order of one angstrom or something like that. I mean of atomic scale. So if those electrons pass individually through those two slits, what we would normally expect is like two regions behind the slits where the electrons go, like a you know, essentially like when you shine light through two little slits, you'll get like a bright region behind one slit and a bright region behind another slit, right? That's what you expect, like coming like light coming in between a curtain or something. But that's not what's happening. When the electrons go through these slits, the electrons go everywhere on the screen. So over here you can see like the first electron goes here and then over here and then over here. It looks pretty random. It looks like a star field. But as the number of electrons on the screen increases, you start to see there is a kind of pattern to this madness. It sort of forms a sinusoidal pattern. And this kind of thing has been seen with light. Uh, light uh, was understood to be a wave-like phenomenon by Newton. Newton thought light was a wave. And he explained the phenomenon of diffraction by constructive and destructive interference. But this is strange. Uh, this had never been noticed before for electrons. And what was even more strange is that it, the pattern, the diffraction pattern, didn't happen uh, repeatably, but it, it sort of came out of nothing in a kind of probabilistic way, in a random way. So this was saying that experiments were random, but the probabilities of obtaining the result could be predicted. Like we could say that the probability of getting that, a bright line there, was greater than having a probability over here. That would be a dark line. So that is really strange. So discrete energy levels and experiments intrinsically being random but only probabilities being predicted. Okay, so just to be sure we understand what probabilities mean, um, here's a distribution of marks from potentially from Chem 3007. Actually, it isn't the distribution from Chem 3007 because um, because uh, last year we had only five students. This year we have you two, only two students. Um, a couple of English people pulled out. They were going to do an exchange, but obviously they couldn't get here because of the virus situation. But in a, in, in, a, in a good class, this is the kind of distribution we want to see. We want to see everyone passing up here at about 70 or 80 percent. And if you're just some Joe Random that rocks up, you, if you don't know anything about you, you should, it would be very, you would be likely to get a mark around here and you wouldn't be likely to fail. So this is like a probability distribution marks. Now remember the square of the wave function is the thing that in quantum mechanics that gives you the probabilities of certain events. So these two observations suggested that quantum mechanics, mass objects, are functions and these functions can describe probability distributions for experimental measurements such as this kind of experiment here. And the second thing is, um, experiments could be def described by operators, and mathematicians already knew that eigenvalues of operators, I'll explain that later, can sometimes be discrete. And these eigenvalues of the operators are the actually the allowed values of that experiment. So there's an experiment for energies, uh, which gives you energy eigenvalues, and there's other eigenvalues for magnetism, which give you the allowed values of magnetic measurements and so on and so forth. And they're all given by operators and functions. Okay, so that's 
basically why uh, quantum mechanics is using functions and operates. Having said that, we're now going to forget all about that and start doing some maths. We're going to get straight into it. So let's talk about vectors. Eh? What are vectors? Because vectors are essentially the Quantum mechanics is based. It, it's not obvious that vectors have anything to do with functions at this stage, but I, I, I'm going to show you that a function is indeed a vector. All right, but first we'll start with vectors. What is a vector? We're going to use some funny notation here. A vector, uh, written by this ket here, this is called a ket, a vector v, and the ket, uh, what makes it a vector is this line and this bracket pointing to the right. That's called a ket. There's another thing where the bracket points to the left. That's called a bra. So this notation was invented by Dirac. Okay, as a vector, uh, vectors, you, sometimes they're written as bold. Sometimes people write them with a line underneath or an arrow on top. We're not going to do that. That's kind of, where, well, people just don't do that in quantum mechanics. They use this bra ket notation is more general. Okay, so the vector is an object which you can add to other vectors and you can multiply that vector by a number uh, to get another vector. There's always another vector which is a multiple of that vector and there's a unique zero vector. So that pretty much summarizes things about vectors. And uh, yeah, so a vector twice the size of V is vector 2V. And that actually is the number 2 times the vector v. So we can multiply numbers and vectors. And also 0 times v is a special vector called the 0 vector. OK, this is all very abstract. And you're probably going, well, geez, if I've got a number, I can definitely multiply a number by 2. And I can multiply a number by 0 too. So what's the difference between a number and a vector? Not very much. Um, vec the only thing, only difference I can see really is that vec you can't divide vectors, whereas you can divide numbers. So numbers have a little bit more properties than vectors. Okay, so let's look at the addition property of vectors. So here are two vectors, uh, v and w, and we can add them together to make another vector u. And importantly, uh, we can the operation of addition doesn't depend on order. In other words, w plus v is the same as v plus w, and both are equal to the vector u. So as well as multiplying them, we can add them together. And we can add together and multiply them. We can, do, we can be daring and do both. So uh, the operation of addition uh, doesn't matter. So that's called uh, a commutative operation. I mention that because operators, when we multiply operators, we'll see that they don't but certainly adding vectors, that does come in. Now, a vector subtracted from itself is zero. So v subtract v is zero. Or, rearranging that, we can say v plus zero equals zero, plus v equals v. If we bring the, uh, and also v minus zero equals v as well. So the zero vector is a kind of nothing thing. We can uh, add zero to that vector and it doesn't change. It leaves it unchanged. It's a bit like 1. When you multiply 1 by something, it doesn't change that. So the 0 is like the thing, well, it's like, a, it's like a thing that doesn't change anything when you do it. What an important concept. Thank you, Arabs, for... Actually, it's the Indians that do that, didn't they? Yes, the Indians invented 0. Yeah. Indians are kind of obsessed with nothing. Right. Now, I'll just mention that the most important cons concept concerning vectors is linear independence, which is used to de uh, determine the dimension of a vector space. Okay, so let's look at that next. Linear independence. Here we are. What is it? So, 
here's a picture of what it means. A set of vectors is linearly dependent if one of the vectors in the set can be written in terms of the others. Okay, so let's look at these ones first. These three vectors in the plane, they're in a flat gray plane here. We can say that if we add probably 0.8 times this vector, and then we add about maybe 0.8 times that vector, and by adding I mean adding head to tail. Mm -hmm. I'll have to show you that in the tutorial if you don't understand adding vectors head to tail. But let's assume that you do understand that for the moment. So we take 0.8 of that vector plus 0.8 of this other vector and we'll get this up, this vector here. So that means the th this vector in the plane here is a dud vector. It doesn't add anything because we can make it from these other two. So it's linearly dependent on the other two. It depends on, on, on a linear combination of those two vectors. Okay, so that's vectors in the plane. We can also go even one further and we, have, we can have three vectors all in a line, right? So all, all the vectors in a line, well, that means all we have to do is multiply one vector to get another vector in the same line. So in that case, uh, the gray plane would actually just be a line. So uh, normally, if the three vectors are pointing in three different directions, uh, the third vector can never be uh, got by adding these two together because these two will make a series of vectors in the plane and we can never go outside of the plane because this one's pointing up, right? So these are three linearly independent vectors. So those three vectors are independent and we say that they, f if we add them all together in all possible ways with all possible multiples, including subtractions, we will get a full three-dimensional space. Whereas here, if we add these vectors all together, we'll never get anything outside of the plane because one of them is a dud vector. So the three vectors, are, this is actually a two-dimensional space because one of them is a dud. And if two of them, if all three of them in a, are in a line, then only one of them is independent. There's actually two dud vectors. Okay, so I hope you've got the concept of linear independence. Um, Mathematicians have to make it a little bit harder, and they say it differently. Uh, a set of vectors is linearly dependent. Well, this is what we said. A well, set of vectors is linearly dependent if one of the vectors in the set can be written in terms of the others. Mathematically, we say that in the opposite way. We say that the vectors v1, v2, vn, we can have up to n vectors, n being just a number, like an integer. These vectors are linearly independent if and only if when we add a combination of these vectors with arbitrary coefficients, if that could equal zero, the only way that can equal zero is if all the coefficients are zero. In other words, the only way to get the zero vector is if we add zero of this vector, zero of this vector, and zero of that vector, all of them zero to get the zero vector. That's a funny way to say it. If any of these, uh, if we can make z the zero vector with any of these coefficients not being zero, any of these coefficients not being zero, then that is linearly dependent. Okay, so let's look at an example. Here's v1, which is some vector a, and here's v2, which is two times some vector a. All right. Now we can make a zero vector because we can say that two times v1 minus v2 equals zero. Why is that? Because two times a, two times v1, which is a, minus v2, which is two a, two a minus two a, vector minus itself is zero, right? But look at the coefficients in front of v1 and v2. It's 2 and minus 1. These coefficients are not 0. You see, if we can make these equal to 0 with some of these numbers not 0, then it's linearly dependent. So this means the vectors a and 2a are linearly dependent. And that makes sense because they're actually one is actually just twice the size of the other. right? They're on the same line. They're pointing in the same direction. 
Okay, question. What's special about these two vectors which makes them linearly dependent? Well, I think I've kind of answered that. They're basically a multiple of one vector. They lie in the same direction. What about these two vectors? Are they linearly dependent? Well, now I've drawn these vectors as arrows and I'm intending that when we add these vectors we add them head to tail. Okay. Now they're in different directions so I think it's fairly obvious it's, we can't, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult to prove actually but we might have to think about it. The only way we can get the zero vector is if we multiply that by zero and add it to another vector this time zero. That's the only way we're going to get zero because if we add these two vectors and they're not zero it will be some other vector in the plane which is not zero. I think that's probably the easiest way to see. And here's another example. So this is a head to tail kind of adding of vectors. Uh, this is just like an algebraic way of adding vectors and here we have vectors as column vectors. By the way vectors are always if you write them as uh, components like this, they're always columns. That's the rule. They're never rows, they're always columns. So here's one vector v1, 1, 0, and here's v2, 0, 1. This could be the x-axis, this could be the y-axis. They're pointing in different directions, so it's pretty clear that these are linearly dependent, linearly independent, sorry. They are not linearly dependent. They're pointing in different directions. What about this one? Here's V1, V2, and V3. Well, this one plus this one equals that one. That one's this one plus this one minus this one is zero. Aha, so we can add these and subtract the last one and get the zero vector. And we don't multiply them by zero, so these are linearly dependent. But it's pretty clear it's linearly dependent because these two add together to give the third one. This is a dud vector. I think you've got the concept of linear independence. So that's the most important thing about um, a series of vectors. Not necessarily orthogonal, um, but any sets of vectors. Let's talk about vector spaces and basis sets. So, what's a vector space? A vector space is the set of all vectors you get by adding any set of vectors together in all possible ways. Okay, so say we have vectors 1, 2, 3, up to n, and let's take a linear combination of them. Maybe 2 times the first one, plus 5 times the fifth one, and all possible combinations that we can think of. Well, that set of vectors, it's an infinite set, obviously, because we can use infinitely <coughs> big numbers and even smaller numbers, that forms a vector space. It's a space of these vectors. If those vectors were like these two, we would have all possible combinations of some multiple of 1, 0 times another multiple times 0, 1. By the way, when we multiply a number times a column vector, it's the same as multiplying every element of that vector by the constant term out the front. Okay, if every vector v can be written uniquely in terms of this basis set, we call this a basis set, a basis, we call it a basis or a basis set for the vector space. If every vector in v can be written uniquely in only one way using these vectors, then the numbers C are called the coefficients of the vector with respect to the basis set. And, in addition, we say that the basis set is linearly independent, and, in addition, we say that the dimension of the space, V, is N. So if all these vectors are linearly independent, then the dimension of this space is N. It's made of N different combinations of these unique and independent vectors. No surprise there. So, 
Here we have x times 1, 0, 0, which can be written as x, 0, 0, y times 0, 1, 0, which can be written as 0, y, 0, and z times 0, 0, 1, which can be written as 0, 0, z. So we add those three together and we get something, a vector r. So any vector in normal space, normal space meaning what we are sort of existing in at the moment, what we can see, more or less, ignoring time and anything else. Uh, normal space can be described by these three terms here, these three vectors. So this is a three-dimensional vector space because all of these are linearly independent. In other words, the z vector can't be made by combining x and y vectors in the plane, right? Aha! Uh -huh. Now, function vector spaces. What if I told you that a function was a vector? Well, they are. Let me show you. Here's a one-dimensional function, f of x. It's defined on the domain 0 to L. Happens to be 0 here and 0 there. So it could be like a piece of string or something, if you want to say what this is. And uh, uh, the value of the function uh, is given by the height or depth below this line, right? So this is just f of x and the y-axis gives you the value. This is the domain on which it's defined and the range is the range of values that the function is uh, giving. Okay, no problem. Question. Consider functions like these defined on 0 to L but all possible functions beginning with 0 and ending with 0. If we have two different functions like that, f and g, and we add them together, does it make another function which also starts at 0 and ends at 0? Yes, it does. Hmm. This is a little bit similar to vectors because vectors you can add them together and you get another vector. Functions, you add them together and you get another function. Okay, well, functions seem to obey the rule of vectors. I mean, they're not vectors, or are they? Well, they obey the rules of vectors. If they obey the rules, maybe it's a vector. Okay. How would you define multiplication of a function by a number? Because we can we can multiply a vector by a number. Can we multiply a function by a number? I think so. Is there a zero function? Is it unique? I think there's only one zero function. The zero function is just this function which is zero all along the line. No matter what value you put f of x being 0 to l, the 0 function, we can call it 0 of x, is always 0. And, by the way, if you add the 0 function to any function, you get the function back itself. Whoa! That's like a 0 vector. If you add the 0 vector to any function, you get the same function. Does the set of functions define like this form of vector space? Why not? We can take any linear combination of these things and we'll get a vector space. A function vector space. Question. Suppose we have two functions, f0 of x equals 1 and f1 of x equals x. Or x to the power 0, which is 1, and x to the power 1, which is x. What does the vector space of these two functions comprise? Well, we'd have to take all linear combinations of these functions, wouldn't we? We would have to take a constant times f of 0 plus another different constant, c2, c1 times f of 1. So c0 times f of 0 plus c1 times f of 1, where those two c's are constants. Let me write it a different way. What if we did a times f of 0 plus b times x? then the vector space would be a plus bx, where a and b are arbitrary constants. 
Well, that would mean the vector space comprises all lines in the plane. Hmm. How would you describe the graph of these functions? Well, they're lines if you graph them. What have you used these functions for in the lab? I can tell you what you've used them for. You've used them for calibration curves. You get lines of best fit. And actually, this is one of the reasons why we're using functions to do this business. We're using functions. We're going to use them to make fits to other functions and data. That's one of the reasons why we're doing this. Anyway, the vector space of these two things is the set of lines. Okay, moving right along. We're moving quick. Hilbert spaces. What are they? The Hilbert space is a vector space, but you get steak knives. There's more. In addition, a Hilbert space is a vector space with an inner product defined between two vectors. What the hell is an inner product? Okay. An inner product is written like this. An inner product takes two vectors and returns a number. And we write the inner product of two vectors like this. We write it as a bra with a bracket pointing to the left, joined onto V with a bracket pointing to the right. That's the ket. So this is a bra ket. It's a bit of a joke. It's a bracket. Bra ket. Uh, Dirac invented this. We, could fit, we forgive him because he was a genius. He actually discovered antimatter before it was. Uh, he predicted the existence of antimatter just before it was uh, observed. It was quite remarkable. Okay, so the inner product, that thing is just a number. Now, when I say a number, by the way, it's not just a real number, it could be a complex number. And in the tutorial, we're going to go through complex numbers. Okay, so complex numbers are obtained from these two vectors like this. And this inner product obeys the following rules, which you need to memorize. So u inner product with v is the same as v inner product with u, complex conjugated. What does complex conjugated mean? Okay, well a complex number is a real number plus a complex number times the number i, which is the square root of minus 1. When you take the complex conjugate, you leave the real number that, that, uh, alone and you reverse the sign of the complex part. So if we have a complex number like 1 plus 2i, where i is the square root of minus 1, its complex conjugate would be 1 minus 2i. We just reverse the sign of the complex part. By the way, the complex conjugate of a complex conjugate gives you the same number back. Okay, so that's the first rule. And of course, um, if the number's real, complex conjugate doesn't do anything because it hasn't got any complex part to reverse. Um, the inner product is linear in the second index. So if we have a uh, vector uh, v, which is c1v1 plus c2v2, and we inner product that with u, we can take the constants out and we get c1 u times v1 plus c2 u inner product with v2. So we say that the inner product is distributive over addition and multiplication. It's a bit like a bracket. Okay. Um, the same thing holds if the linear combination is on the left side, but there's one, one trick. Um, the, the trick is that if it's on the left side, when you bring the constants out, they are complex conjugated. C1 star and C2 star. So these two are quite easy, except for the complex conjugation here. Um, and the last property is the most interesting one. The inner product of any vector with itself is bigger than zero, or equal to zero. If it is equal to zero, um, two, uh, the inner product of a vector with another vector is zero, if and only if one or both of those vectors is the zero vector. Now, we can define a length of a vector by the square root of its inner product. And the length is just 
we put a bar here with a V and a bar. That's like an absolute value. An absolute value of a number it makes it positive. And this is the positive square root of this thing. And by the way, this is always a real number. It's not a complex number. So VV, V in the product V is a real number, bigger than or equal to zero. And the square root is its length, written like that. Okay, uh, we're going to review uh, complex numbers in the tutorial. So these are some uh, pages taken out from Atkins, and I have to invent some problems for you for doing the tutorial. Um, I better do that. Get on to it tomorrow morning. So um, we won't do all of this stuff, but you should be familiar with complex numbers because they're pretty important, really. Okay, Hilbert spaces. Um, here are some examples of inner products. Um, a very special case of an inner product is a dot product. So if we have two vectors given by column, columns of coefficients like u1 to un and v1 to vn, the dot product is u1 star times v1, u2 star times v2 plus dot 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 un star times vn. So basically we, we multiply each of the components and add them up, making sure that we complex conjugate the one on the left. That's called a dot product. And that's an inner product. Um, we can say, we can define the angle between two vectors, cosine of theta, is the inner product divided by the length of the two vectors. That's actually um, a theorem. And you can think of it as a theorem or a definition, actually, of the cosine of the angle between two, two vectors. Here's another example. Um, for two functions, f and g, uh, now functions. Remember we were thinking maybe functions were vectors? Well, they certainly obey all the rules of vectors. Um, can we also define an inner product for them? Well, here's an inner product. Um, inner product f bra with g ket, these are two functions, so this thing must be a number. And we define the inner product like this, integral from a to b, f of x star times g of x integrated. We take the product of the two functions, complex conjugate f, and integrate over this integral. The area under the curve is what the integral is, right? So that's a number. Could be a complex number, but it's a number. Question. Does inner product f function g defined above satisfy inner product rules? Hmm. Interesting. Well, what are the rules? We'll have to go back. There's f g equals g f complex conjugate. There's f times, is it distributed over the second one? Is it sesquilinear over the first coordinate? Sesquilinear means it's complex conjugated but distributed on the left, as I explained over here. A bit of a, bit of a technical word there, sesquilinear. And the most important thing is, is the inner product of a function with itself a positive number? Uh, is that bigger than zero or equal to zero unless the two functions are zero? Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Don't know. But it certainly looks like that. And that looks like f of x g of x. And we add them all together. It's a bit like this. U of i, v of i, where i is 1, 2, 3, and we add them all together. So we could use a, like a summation notation for this, like a sum i equals 1 to n of u i star v i. That then looks very similar to this. Instead of a sum, we have an integral f of x g of x. Instead of the x, we have an i over here. See? They are remarkably uh, similar, aren't they? Well, we're going to expand on that in a second. <coughs> 
We're going to expand on that right now. Functions are infinite dimensional vectors. Now, this is probably the most important idea in quantum mechanics. Okay, so pay attention now. Here's a function, we've seen it before. And what we would like to do is approximate this function. Now I'm going to approximate it in a very brain dead way. I'm going to say, let's, re let's divide this interval up into uh, 20 pieces and let's record the values of this function as numbers like f of x1, f of x2, f of x3 and let's write them as a, as a column f of x1, f of x2, blah blah, f of xn let's simplify that, let's just call it f1, f2, blah 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 up to fn right, these set of numbers for uh, this discrete version of the function is somehow some kind of approximation to this continuous function so we write ket f is approximately equal to ket fn where fn is like a series of numbers in a column and we can take as many as we like right presumably if we take an infinite number there's no difference between them but of course we could never write down all those infinite numbers so we make it finite but doesn't this look like a vector in fact we can write that as a number fi times a vector ket xi where xi is like a vector with a 1 in the ith position right because this is f1 times 1 0 0 0 plus f2 times 0 1 0 0 plus f3 times 0 0 1 0 0 0 0 all the way up to fn right where the xi's are like 1's having the 1 in the ith position like this this is like a generalization of the x, y, z axes, isn't it? So these x, i functions are like spike functions. They're like spikes. Imagine these x, i's being equal to 1 just at that point and 0 everywhere else. That's what the x, i's are kind of like. Not really, but they're kind of like that. If we were going to graph them. If we were going to graph them. Now, these xi's are actually orthonormal, they're orthogonal and normalized. xi in the product with itself is 1. xi in the product with any other xi with a 1 in a different position is 0. So xi times x, xi in the product with xi is equal to 1 if i equals j, and xi in the product with xj is 0 if i is not equal to j. We can write this more compactly, compactly using a symbol called the uh, Kronecker delta, delta ij. Don't be scared of that. Delta ij just means 0 if i is not equal to j and 1 if i equals to j. So it's just a shorter way of writing that. And this is actually the relationship which tells you when a basis set is orthon orthonormal. Okay, so these xi's are kind of like an orthonormal basis set. Weird. Okay, so let's summarize what we've got. Here's the approximate function. It's divided uh, into a number of pieces. It doesn't have to be evenly divided, but if they are evenly divided, the, the difference between these points would be the length divided by n plus 1, if there are n plus 1 points from 0 to L. And we store them like that. So we imagine the approximate function to be represented by n perpendicular axes, one for each axis xi. This is a completely different way of thinking about representing functions. It's not really anything you could have come across before, unless you've done more maths than I have thought. So, the picture on the left is the graph of the function. But the new way of thinking about it is more like this. It's f1 along a kind of x-axis, f2, a component f2 along 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, f3 along 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, f4 along 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So there's a fourth, fifth, sixth. In this case, there would be 20 dimensions. So the function here can be represented as a graph 
or it can be represented as a 20 dimensional vector. Now that sounds way more fancy than it is. It just means you've got 20 numbers down the column here. Nevertheless, it is a different way of thinking about things. So how does this dot product between these approximate functions f, n and g n compare with the inner product between two actual functions f and g? Like the integral one. So here's the dot product f n g n which is an inner product. It's f i star g i which is actually equal to f x of i star times complex conjugate, that's not a multiply, times g of x i summed i equals 1 to n right? That's what this summation means. I left the i equals 1 to n off. Now as we increase the number of points n, supposedly this approximation becomes better, yeah? However, if we increase the number of points n, we get more and more of these product numbers appearing and this starts to get bigger and bigger. It starts to go to infinity as n goes to infinity. Oh no, NASA! We have a problem. So this actually isn't defined as n goes bigger and bigger. Well, it is defined and becomes infinity. However, we can fix this. We can get a sensible number. We have to scale the dot product so that it doesn't become infinite. In order to do that, we can multiply this by delta, which is L divided by n plus 1. We multiply that by the width here. Now, if we do that, we will start to get an approximation to the area under the curve. F of xi, g of xi, times delta. We start to get an approximation to the area under the curve, which is the product of the two functions. So that thing looks essentially like the integral of f of x, g of x, times dx. Instead of the delta, we have a dx. And instead of i going 1 to n, it goes 0 to l course these x's are in here. So limit as n goes to infinity of f n g n in a product, this infinite thing, if we multiply that by delta, magically that becomes equal to the integral. So you see, the dot product is a kind of scaled up version of the integral. It becomes infinite, but in order to make the integral sensible, we have to multiply by this dx thing. So why did I tell you that? I'm telling you this because functions really are, you can think of them as vectors in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. As n becomes into infinity, we can think of a function as an infinite dimensional vector. So more like this, with multiple axes, rather than the graph like this. Okay? It's important you have this different picture in your head. Now, once you've got that picture, you start to see that functions and vectors are very, very similar kinds of things, and you can use geometry to do everything you need to do with functions. I'm going to skip Schwartz economy in inequality. Um, you can read about that. So, the last topic we're going to do is dual basis sets. Right, I'm getting a bit tired, it's late. Suppose we are given a vector expanded in a basis set. So here's a vector v, and it equals vici, summed over some basis vectors, n of them, and these are coefficients, just like we had before. Suppose we're given the vector v, and we're given these basis vectors, that can be whatever, any kind of vectors, as long as they're linearly independent. How would we find the coefficients c? Mm. Well, we can find the coefficient c by using the dual basis set. Let me explain this. It's a bit tricky. Okay, so one thing that we can do is we can take the inner product of this vector with another vector, and that will give us a number, and maybe we'll get a series of equations which we can then solve for the unknown coefficients c. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take that vector and we're going to take the dot product of that vector 
with one of the other basis vectors, like this. And what we get is a number. We're going to call it cj dash. It isn't this cj, it's a different number. This is the coefficient that we want to find. This cj dash is the dot product of the vector we are given with the known basis vector vj. Okay, let's work out what that thing is. So remember, we are given v and we are the problem is we are given v and we are given all these vectors vi. Somebody's written them down. And we want to find out what these coefficients are. We want to find we want to find out the expansion coefficients. That's a kind of useful thing, right? To express a vector in terms of its components. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so that's what it is. So we can carry this vj through to v. We've got the summation, and here we have an inner product of vj with vi, summed i equal to n with ci. Now this quantity here is just a number. We're going to call it sji. In fact, that's the overlap matrix. It's a matrix because it has two sub-indices. We're going to co cover matrices as well. In fact, that's the first thing we're going to do so here sum equals i equals 1 to n, matrix SGJI times CI. We've just rewritten this. Now, if you remember your matrix multiplication, which we will review, this is the matrix product of matrix S times column vector C. So it's matrix S times column vector C. This is the matrix S. It has two indices. So S. 2, 2 is the dot product of V2 with V2. S2, 1 would be the product of V2 with V1. If they're orthogonal, that would be 0. If this is an orthonormal basis set, all of these diagonal elements would be equal to 1. Right? In fact, SJI would be equal to the Kronecker delta JI, if it was orthogonal, but we're not assuming that. Okay, so the end result is it's S times SJ, and we can write this out in full matrix notation now. This is the jth element of this matrix product. We can write this as C dash equals S times C. We can pre-multiply both sides by the inverse matrix to solve. So pre-multiplying that gives us S to the minus 1 C dash. S to the minus 1 times S gives us 1 uh, times C. So C is equal to S to the minus 1 times C dash. Alright, so that's the answer. We've worked out what the coefficients are in terms of the overlap matrix, which are these dot products, and the dot products of the vector on the right hand side. Let's keep going. We can now expand that out. Remember, C dash C is equal to S to the minus 1 times C dash. So C is equal to S to the minus 1 matrix. That's IJ times C dash. C dash is VJV, remember? CJ dash is VJV. We put S to the minus 1 times C dash. Here we put S to the minus 1 times C dash. We expand that out. Now look what I'm doing. I'm putting brackets around this bit and the vj because that's involving a sum over j there's no sum over i because i is on the left hand side this quantity in here we call the dual vector and we write it v superscript i so that's v superscript i times v that's interesting so if we take the dual vector and take the dot product or inner product of the dual vector with v we get the unknown coefficient that we were after. We just have to know what this dual vector is. Well, the trick is we do have to invert this overlap matrix to get this um, dual vector. But putting that aside, they are kind of useful quantities. We just need to dot product. Okay, so thus to get the expansion coefficient CI, you need to make take the dual vector and take the inner product of V. Dual vectors are used for taking inner products with normal vectors, especially to get the expansion coefficients in a basis set. 
they're very useful in relativity theory and if you do crystallography these are called reciprocal as you will do later these are called reciprocal lattice vectors and they describe the directions of reflecting planes of atoms in a crystal so they're extremely useful and they crop up everywhere question what does the ith dual vector look like when the basis set is orthonormal Okay, well, if the basis set is orthonormal, as I said, the S matrix is a Kronecker delta. It's a unit matrix. It's equal to the unit matrix. Now, the inverse of the unit matrix is itself. So, actually, in the case of an orthonormal basis set, the dual vector is equal to the original vector itself. So, VI with the superscript is just equal to VI. So if you have an orthogonal basis set, the dual of that orthogonal basis set is the same basis set. But not if it's not orthogonal. Okay, the following summarizes the idea of dual vectors. If we have a ket, vi, if we take the dual of it, we get a bra, and the i goes up, and it's equal s to the minus 1 ij vj. That's what we derived. And likewise, if we have bra and we take the dual of that we get a ket again the i goes up and we have this s to the minus one i j b j these are kind of just expressions that you should know so when you take the dual you need to reverse the sense of the brackets complex conjugate any numbers in this case the s's might are real and we raise or lower any basis set indices and include the overlap matrix inverse, but only if the basis set is not Okay. Question. Show that the dual vector dot product with any other vector in the original basis set is the Kronecker delta. Let's see how that works. Well, it's just a plug and chug. The strategy is to start with the left-hand side and see if you can get the right-hand side. So let's start with the left-hand side. We expand out V superscript I. That gives us S to the minus 1 IK times VK. But VKJ is the overlap matrix SKJ. So we have SIK to the minus 1. That's part of the definition of VI superscript times SKJ. This is a matrix multiplication of S to the minus 1 S and this is the ij element. S to the minus 1 S is 1. The unit matrix ij element is just the Kronecker delta. There we go. Proved. So, just to conclude now, and this is actually what we'll be covering in the tutorial, uh, basic rules for matrices. So matrices, what are they? They're grids of numbers, usually square, and they're usually denoted by bold indices like A and B and S, like we had before, just like vectors, at least component-wise vectors. Column vectors are also matrices. Matrices can be added together. You add them component-wise. Matrices can be multiplied by numbers. You multiply the number through every element. You don't add them. You just multiply every element of the matrix by 2, if you want to multiply the matrix by 2. Same with vectors. Matrices can be multiplied by each other. We'll explain how in a second. If they are compatible. In other words, they have to say the matrix of the first one has to have the same number of elements in the rows, uh, in the uh, columns, as the number of rows in the second one. Matrix multiplication does not always commute. In other words, matrix A times matrix B does not always equal matrix B times matrix A, unlike numbers. Okay, And by the way, you can't multiply vectors together. You can't. You can multiply a matrix times a vector and a matrix times a matrix. That's okay. That's not to say there are matrices that don't that can commute. For example, if B was equal to 1, it would commute. A times 1 is equal to 1 times A. 
but in general a times b is not equal to b times a. There is a unique zero matrix and that is the one with all zeros in it. There's a unique unit matrix which is the Kronecker delta. It just has ones along the diagonal, it's a square matrix, and zeros elsewhere. And as I said, a times 1 is equal to 1 times a, so it behaves like 1. And uh, by the way, the inverse of 1 is also itself. The matrix may have an inverse, a to the minus 1. It doesn't always. And if it does, a times a to the minus 1 is equal to a times a to the minus 1 times a. So we, a commutes with a to the minus 1. And the product of those two things is 1. You can actually prove it from this previous relationship here. Uh, later on we'll show that the determinant debt of A, the determinant of the matrix is zero if A to the minus one does not exist. So the determinant is kind of important for deciding when an inverse does not occur. Here is the rule for multiplying matrices. Um, if we're interested in the 2, 2 element of the result A times B, we take the second row of the first matrix and the second column of the B matrix and we take the dot product of those two things and it gives us C22. If we were interested in C21, we would take the second row of A times the first dot product times the first column of B to get C21, right? So this is a bit like a minus one. Minus going that way, one down the B, minus one, dot product, and where they intersect, we write down the element of the product matrices. So we're gonna practice some of those, okay? And here's a few things from Atkins, which you can read too. You probably won't, because in the tutorial we'll cover everything like this, which you need to know about matrices. And some problems that you can look at here, which we will look at in the tutorial, um, are over here. So we'll give that a go. There's the determinant there, uh, which we'll cover later. All right, that's it. My God, I've, rec I've recorded that. So now I can see if this is any good, this video. It's a bit late. Um, sorry about that. Now I've figured out how to do it at home, I will do it more often. See you later.